Um, so, oh, excellent. Okay, so for those of you who joined us yesterday, I see um, at least a couple of people have returned. Uh, welcome back. So yesterday, uh, we briefly talked about um, the scope of the Brain Image Library and the kinds of data that we're collecting and, and how we're making those data available to you. Um, we talked about how to access data um, uh, going through the Build portal, how to send data to Bill using uh, various services that we have available. We talked a bit about using um, On Demand, um, which is a service that we provide uh, to allow you to interact with the data um, in a relatively easy way for a data cleanup and organization. We talked about um, the ways in which we uh, suggest that you organize uh, files to be uh, uploaded to Bill. And I'll talk a little bit later um, and give some more context to the organization structure that um, Mariah suggested yesterday as, as to why um, we find this useful. Um, we also talked about how uh, creating, how you would create metadata files uh, to submit um, basic metadata information about your data sets, um, how you would upload those metadata, um, and then eventually submit this information for publication on the Brain Image Library. Um, and finally, um, how we validate those data, the, the length of time, the considerations involved in, in um, the validation process, and as well, um, how you would request a DOI so that we can uh, make these data um, uh, persist um, for publication purposes. And then we had a brief discussion afterwards, which I think was very helpful. Um, so today, uh, what I'd like to do is, is continue um, the workshop to discuss more, not so much about data um, submission to the bill, but how once your data is here, or if you want to take advantage of data that we already have available at the Brain Image Library, um, how you can do that. So this is a data exploration here on day two. So initially, uh, what we want to talk a bit about is um, our website how you find information in the inventory and the DOI landing pages, um, the kinds of tools that we have available. And, and then we'll move on to doing a Jupyter Labs uh, demo, um, a couple of Jupyter Labs demos and take a short break. And then when we come back, I wanna talk a bit about um, the visualization ecosystem that we have at Bill and, and visual e visualization ecosystems that we're building. Um, and then finally, we will uh, finish off with how to use um, some of the high performance computing um, infrastructure that we have here using Slurm and, and modules um, loaded onto the Bill ecosystem. And then there'll be uh, plenty of time at the end for questions and discussion. Please you know, feel free to, to stay afterwards and ask questions. I will certainly be here. Uh, the team will be here through four and I'm happy to stay later if, if I can be of help to the group. Um, if there's any questions, sorry. All right, if there's any questions now, um, you know, please feel free to ask. Um, we will also have be monitoring the chat, so please, you know, consider uh, putting questions in the chat, and we'll do our best to interact with you that way. Um, this should be, you know, an interactive um, session, so you know, feel free to unmute and and just ask your question to the group. It's a very small group. Um, I'm going to now pass the mic over uh, to Mariah, who's going to get you acquainted with how to find Bill here, uh, how to find information here on the Bill um, uh, website. All right. Thanks, Alan. Um, before we begin, I just want to do a quick bit of, of housekeeping here. So let me share my screen so if you um so in the in the email that you were all sent uh that includes all the information there's a link to the portal which has all of the um links to different things that that you'll need for the workshop today there is the link to the github that includes the day one and two presentations, um, notebooks that you'll be working with today, um, and, and anything else. So if you're looking for slides for what I'm about to speak about, those are included here. Um, and let's go into some data exploration and how to, how to work with the data in Bill. 
and what resources we have available. But uh, if any, everyone could take some time right now to go to ondemand.phil.psc.edu and please log in with your bill account information. Um, your, you have likely already set up an account with access and sent an email to uh, bill support requesting access to the bill resources. And so please comment in the chat if you go to this on-demand uh, screen, you log in with your username and password and you cannot log in so that I can get you set up with um, someone on the team to help you get access to everything if needed. Just take a moment for everyone to do that. Are there any, can I see a uh, thumbs up if you're ready to go? All right. Okay, I don't see anyone saying that they have any major issues, but uh, if you do, please let us know and I will get you into a, a breakout room with either Luke or, or Ivan to kind of help get things going along. But if you have any issues, uh, we're, we're just gonna talk for first about what data is in Bill. Um, the, we have, I believe over 6,000 data sets currently available at the Raymond Image Library of mouse, marmoset, and human um, data sets that include many different modalities, light sheet, F most, um, uh, or, or modalities including uh, the different instruments, sorry, like mic microscopes of, of different modalities, including cell morphology, connectivity, spatial transcriptomics, um, including partial whole brain images. And so we really are a, a, a specific, uh, you know, very concentrated repository, but we do, um, more general, it is kind of more generalist for the, the brain imaging because um, there's so many types of imaging and so many different modalities. Um, but if you're looking for, where do I find all of this data? There are a few different ways to find and interact uh, with bill data. First, if you already know what you're looking for and you're looking to just um, have access to that data, there is the bill file system. We do have a search portal available on our website and I'll show you a little bit of that um, and uh, what are the tips and tricks for <laughs> interacting with the search portal. And then of course, if you have a DOI that um, has already been issued for a data set, of course, that's a great way to cite and find and access data and bills through a DOI. So it's an overview of kind of where to find these things. We spoke a little bit about this yesterday during data submission uh, and how data is organized in Bill, but it is organized by submission. So every submission that you have will be in its own unique directory whenever it is moved to the public side of, of the uh, file system. The path to the public data utilizes that submission ID number. There are unique directories for each data set within that. And the path for these sub, for the directories includes the first two um, characters of the submission ID and the second two characters of the submission ID. So if this is my, if this ABCD is the collection ID and bill data, which bill data is the public, um, public side of the database, if my, Collection ID is, starts with ABCD. It'll be the first um, subdirectory is AB, the second subdirectory is CD, and then the next directory and down would be ABCD, the entire submission ID, just to have an idea of 
where if you're submitting, that is where your data will be whenever it's made public, but also kind of uh, gives you a little bit of an idea of how to interact and move around through different submissions in the brain image library. This um, path to the file on the file system does directly translate to a URL to access all of the data. So if we replace this build data with download.brainimagelibrary.org, then we can access this um, via any um, internet browser that you're using, right? So we can see that this data set includes all of these PNGs if we want to go up. There's an examples data set there. That's the that's the root directory for this submission. And then this is a B. So uh, let's go back here. That's, that's interacting with the portal and how to, to access it via um, the URL. Next, if you go to submit.brainimagelibrary.org slash search, or if you go to Brain Image Library and go to data access, there's an inventory dropdown. Then you can interact with it, uh, with all of the data and search for data using this search portal. It includes the, the path on disk and also the, the link here for the, the data in the metadata. And I also want to point out that there is a CSV format of the brain um, inventory that includes all of the entries for, for every data set. So let's take a look at that actually, just so we can. Um... So I'm going to go to brainimagelibrary.org, go to the brain inventory, and then I'm going to take a look at this the CSV that we download. Um, and of course it opened in my other window here. So let me grab it. And so we can see easily these are meta different metadata versions. Yesterday we talked a little bit about um, why we have two different metadata versions and how those are all being updated. Um, you can see project, if it's included for BICCN, uh, the sub this uh, submission ID, other information on affiliation, species, uh, all the other metadata that you would need, titles, abstracts, um, where it is on disk. And um, you can, this is a, an easy way if you'd like to do a quick search of, of or a quick overview or of what we have actually available in Bill. This is a some people prefer to kind of search through a, a single file like this instead of using the um, search tools here. So it's just more options of how to find data that you'd like. And then of course, the, the third option of how to find a data set that you're looking for is to have a DOI issued for it. <laughs> And um, especially if you have a, a publication that you want to group different data sets from different submissions, I highly suggest having a DOI issued for that so that we can group anything uh, that's within different, sub that you've submitted over different um, quarters or anything like that. We can consolidate all of that into either a group DOI for you or a data set DOI that's issued for every single individual data set. So um, we'll just take a look at one of these again. Um, this might be a little bit of um, review for people who are here for the first day, but if you weren't here for the first day, um, there is a way to group all of the information for how to access your data. The data for a DOI is included at the bottom, includes all of the, ab the title, abstract, methods, technical information, uh, and links to any publications or related information here. I did mention that we have these two different versions and these are being updated to the newer standard. The link to the newest brain standard is included here if you'd like to read about how this was created and the process behind that. And but while we're in this transition period, it is uh, good to note that 
if there is missing information or you notice that this this uh, field that you're looking for is maybe not available for um, one of the data sets and you're wondering why, why is this information not there? It might be because it's in a, an older version. And so we are doing our best to, to work with all the data providers over Bill to update their metadata to the current standard. Um, but it does take some time. So just to let you know that those two different, two different versions do exist. And a quick overview of the tools available at Bill, which is really what we're going to spend most of our time today talking about. So the computational resources that you all have access to just by signing up um, one to come to this workshop today and um, or any, anyone who requests to have an account at Bill gets access to the Bill analysis ecosystem. We'll talk more about what is actually included in this analysis ecosystem, but it is made up of several large memory machines um, and equipped with modern GPUs. But the perks of kind of having this bill analysis ecosystem located at the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center is that uh, if you would like, you also can request um, access to computational resource resources such as Bridges 2. Uh, the, this is another NSF-funded supercomputer located at the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. Um, that has even more memory and nodes and things like that. So in case you're doing something a little more computationally intensive that you uh, want to request even more resources for, Bridges 2 is an option for you. Uh, then- Can I ask a also, quick question on that, on the center there? Um, mm -hmm. Do you have a lot of, are there a lot of examples of folks using that um, on bill data? like broadly, or is it just a few users who use it a lot? Um, I'm curious about kind of the uh, use pattern there. Mm, yeah, I think, I'm not sure if I can answer that question for you. I'm not sure if Alan knows, Alex would be the person who would know the answer to that question for sure. Um, but I'm not sure about the historical use of Bridges 2 with, with Bill Data. Yeah, I mean, Alex would be the best person to answer that question, Brock. Um, okay. I know. I know. There's a push um, to, in the future, probably put most of Bill computation on bridges too, um, and and that's something that is um, in the works, but is not quite um, uh, ready at the moment. That said, you know, if you need the additional compute resources, get in contact with us, and and we can let you know how to take advantage of the bridges too. Um, infrastructure. Um, oh, Ivan, Ivan is probably a, an excellent resource here to chime in. He has his hand up. Please, Ivan. Yeah, so, so we have some users using Bridges too. Uh, the main difference is that there's no charge for using the, the Brain Image Library resources. Uh, however, if you were to use uh, something like Bridges too, you would have to write a proposal and it will get approved for an allocation. Um, so yes, the data is mounted on Bridges too, as long uh, as well as Neocortex. But in order to use those resources, you need to write a proposal. Um, I would say most of our users are in um, using bill infrastructure, but in some edge cases, people have requested allocations to do uh, larger computations or to have access to the GPU compute nodes. Gotcha. Very helpful. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah, and Ivan might uh, mention Neocortex. So Neocortex is uh, another resource that's available. It's targeted more at um, AI and it provides hardware specifically for development of algorithms and so uh, and, and graph uh, analytics. So if you were doing a project that wanted to either you know use brain image library data to train a model or something like that, uh, Neocortex is uh, the build data is also mounted on Neocortex, so that it makes it an easy resource for you to use as well. Um, there are links here if you would like to read more about those. Um, or uh, look at how to get access to those resources. I won't talk about more neocortex, but we will talk a little, a little bit about bridges too. Um, and then it, there are some other resources available to access these, or there are tools available to access these resources. We'll talk about open on demand uh, and uh, 
how to use JupyterLab. And our studio is also supported on open on demand uh, if you are looking to run some R code um, uh, using brain image library data. You can also interact with these resources with via remote desktop, either using uh, X2Go uh, or, or GTX, which in the, is another remote de a desktop that for that has low latency um, and is for more of a graphic in, intensive graphic applications. And so for the brain image library, you all have access to the analysis ecosystem. It's made up of eight nodes with three terabytes of RAM. Uh, the, there's 80 cores per node, 20 per CPU, four CPUs per node. And so I think Ivan will talk a little bit more about the analysis ecosystem and all of the, how to interact with this and how to um, access all of these resources just so that you're all aware Bridges 2 is available at no cost for resource and education, but you do have to um, apply and, and get uh, a um, apply and get access via via access. I know that sounds weird, doesn't it? Um, but just to give you an idea of what the capabilities are there, there are 488 regular memory nodes that have 256 uh, gigs of RAM, six of 16 that have 500. Uh, and 12 gigabytes of RAM. There are also extreme memory nodes that have four terabytes of RAM and GPUs that are also available via Bridges 2. All of the data is uh, mounted on Bridges 2 so you can have direct access to these resources. Ivan, do you, yeah, Ivan, do you wanna say something? Yeah, I, I just wanted to make one comment in relation to Bridges and, and Bill. So the, the eight compute nodes that you have uh, freely available on bill are large memory nodes, uh, whether in Bridges 2, you have to request an allocation to get access to those. Um, so keep in mind that, yes, you can scale up to Bridges 2, but bill should be the place where you start exploring our data just because the resources are unbounded. To the you know well they're bounded by by hardware but we don't pull allocations or or limits on on computation. Sure, thanks. Katie, Ivan, do you want to answer Katie's question, which is, can I install Docker on an on-demand node? No, that was quick. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> So due to due to some security concerns, there are no systems, public systems on um, on PSC that will support Docker. They do support Singularity containers, which is an alternative uh, technology. We do support U Docker. U Docker is a library that will allow you to download existing containers from the web and run them but it will not allow you to modify them and it puts some restrictions. Uh, but it has to be a public Docker image too then or something? Uh, yes, yes. Or, or either it needs to be public or you might need, or you need to log into your account in order to pull. But as a general rule, everything is an edge case related to Docker. So we can talk offline and we can figure out if we can make something happen. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, I was just wondering, like, because we had, were talking about, like, extracting, you know, bundles of files in that uh, location. Okay. Okay, thanks. So just as a quick um, example here, I just wanted to show you that if you were just to show how Bridges 2 and Bill are kind of um, how how that's mounted. I just want to log on to um, bill. So if I SSH on the bill, I can log on. I think if I got my password right. And so if I wanted to go and see bill data, uh, and then let's look at that. This is the example um, data that we were looking at at the very beginning. And, but 
I can also do this once I have access to bridges too. And so I've logged on to page two and I can go to build data. I can type, oh. Sorry, I am, it's frozen on me, sorry. Yeah, do do Sorry. CD. <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 Mariah. No, no, no. It's it's just it's the nature of how it's mounted. Do yeah. CD build first. No, no, just do don't that don't complete it. Just do that. And it will take a little while. There yeah, goes. no, it was just that it was just frozen on me. <laughs> because it's in 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 our system, the data is mounted at all times. In bridges is auto mounted. So that first tab mm -hmm. to mount and it takes a few seconds in order to show. It's not as quick as as doing it directly on build. Yeah, sorry guys, but as you can see here, it is build data is directly available on on bridges too. So I just wanted to show what that looked like, and with that, I am going to. Are there any questions about what uh, we just spoke about? I know it was kind of a high level, um, quick overview about what's available at Bell, but please let me know if you have any questions about that. Uh, and with that, I believe Iana was going to present next about the man, Jupiter Lab, all of that good stuff. So take it away. Thanks. Thanks, Mariah. Let me share my screen. Okay, so um, let me introduce myself. My name is Jana Vasilieva. I'm a postdoctoral associate at the Center of Biologic Imaging, University of Pittsburgh. And I'm going to talk today about how to use Jupyter Notebooks to solve some common image analysis tasks at Bale. So if you're logged in on the on demand, you will see this dashboard. And I want you to select the Jupyter Lab icon here. So here we will be allocating resources uh, using Slurm, and I want you to allocate eight hours, uh, one node, and use these arguments for the Slurm resources. Let me paste it into the chat. Um, I wonder how I access the chat here. Okay, sorry. So uh, dash n is for eight cores, and dash dash memory is 64 gigabytes. Please type this. And then press the launch button, and you will see the window like this once the Jupyter has started. And please put the thumbs up reaction if you see this window. Yeah. Let me see. OK, Peter, great. Anybody else got it to this point? If you post the arguments we're supposed to put in chat, please. Oh, yes, let me try. Uh, thanks, Brock. Oh, OK, somebody did it. Thank you so much. Yes, Ivan, you have your hand yes. up. Yes, I just wanted to make one comment for everyone. The maximum, the maximum wall time you can allocate a resource is 48 hours. Thank you. Okay, any more thumbs up? Uh, in the meantime, I can tell you briefly about the Jupyter Notebooks. So uh, Jupyter Notebooks are an increasingly popular tool that is used by researchers, by education workers, and data scientists to share their work and to collaborate on, for example, on Google Collab platform. Um, basically, it's a client server um, web application 
where the client is your browser and the server runs one of the kernels available. So historically it was uh, just the IPython kernel and before they were called uh, IPython notebooks and now they are renamed to Jupyter. I'm sure the planet Jupyter is very upset with us, but well. Um, so here, um, once we are all accessing this window, we can create a new notebook. We have also other options to access Python console or the shell or other options, but we will select creating a new notebook. It will take a second. And let me quickly uh, describe the interface that we have here. So first, once we create a new notebook, we get an empty cell, which is of type code but we can change it to markdown or row. Let's change it to markdown. And this is now a comment. So let me make it a title. Um, so let me call it copy files. And once I'm done with my cell to run the cell, I can press control and enter. So now I have the cell with the title. So if I add another cell, so I can either use um, this button here or I can press B. Um, to create a cell below current one. And this cell is by default type code. And currently I'm running the Python kernel. As you can see here, now the kernel is in status idle, so it's doing nothing. And let me type some Python code here uh, to try it out. So let's print a number of seconds in a day. So it will be 24 hours multiplied by 60 minutes in an hour and multiplied by 60 seconds in a minute. And let's we'll see what we have. Uh, we have our first output. So once the output is received, we have a number for this cell, for this output. So we can create new cells. Um, we can duplicate them. Here we can move them up or down like this, we can delete the cells. And uh, also there is a helpful main menu here where we can export our notebook in a variety of formats, for example, HTML, a raw Python script, or PDF, or even a presentation. Um, here in the edit menu, we can merge cells, split cells and arrange them any way we want. So in the run menu, we can run a selection of cells or just run all cells in the notebook. And in the kernel tab, we can restart the kernel if something went wrong, and then we lose all our variables and start over. Um, so also we can do the shell commands from within the notebook. So to do that, we need to start the command in the cell with the exclamation mark. For example, if we do pwd and then press control enter, we get our current working directory, which is my home directory, slash bill, slash users, slash noisy sky. And here should be your username instead of mine. So now let's please create the empty cell and um, copy the notebooks that we will be using today in our home directories. So let me get to the chat and paste this command. So please paste this command in an empty cell. And once you're done, you can hit control enter. And the folder with the notebooks should appear in your home directory. And please put the thumbs up reaction if you have this folder with the notebooks in your home directory. Let me see if it worked for you. If, oh, great, bro. Uh, if you run into any problem, please let us know unmute and just go ahead and tell. Great, Christine. Thank you for the reactions. You can put the thumbs back down. Thanks, Matt. Okay, so now if we go to the directory with the notebooks, we will see the two notebooks that we will be running today. Uh, the first exercise will be visualizing the neuron morphologies and we will use the Python library called Neuron for that. So once you opened uh, this notebook, I want you to go to the run menu and select run all cells. Because the installation of the packages might take a while. And 
I wanted you to put the thumbs up if you get to this imports cell and it gets executed correctly. So currently it's pending and we see that the kernel here has stayed as busy and now we are running this first cell and once these cells are done, they will have numbers next to them. And so once you get the number next to this cell with imports and you don't get any errors, please put the thumbs up. So let me quickly talk about the uh, neuron morphologies file structure. So they are uh, structured according to the SWC specification. So most of these files are SWC. Uh, SWC just stands for the names of the three scientists that first came up with this format. And the SWC file is basically a table in which um, there are eight columns with data points. So the location of each point, the corresponding radius of filament, uh, the number of this point, so the structure which is it identifies, and the parent of this point, if any. So usually the root is the sum of the neuron, and then the dendrites are its children. So basically this table identifies a tree-like structure. And we have as many rows in the table as there are points in the tracings. So let me see if you got to the point where the imports were successful. Okay, great. So it's working for us. Let's go ahead and see what's going on next. So I'm going to visualize the SWC files from Bill and um, to uh, to find the files that I want to visualize, I'm going to brainimagelibrary.org and I'm going to data access and brain inventory. And I will select the modality cell morphology. And for example, I'm interested in the particular investigator name. So I'm adding the filter here. So I'll remove the technique fmost, uh, which I had here. And I'll add the investigator filter. And for example, I have this directory here, which is the path at the build file system. I just copy it and then I insert it to my notebook. It's the same file folder as I have here. And um, if I do an ls command, the shell command that displays the contents of the folder with substituting this Python variable, which contains the path to the folder, I will get the files that I have in there. And so there are two SWC files. I will be looking at this transform file and I will copy the name of the file into the file name variable. And then I'll join the, the path to directory and the file name and I get the full path to my SWC file. So the Neurom library offers a few command line utils like the Neurom check which allows to see if this neuron morphology is a valid SWC in the standard format, because there are several variations to SWC formats and the neuron library works uh, best with the standard format. But even if this check doesn't go well, you still can visualize the neuron. It might be just missing some dendrites or an axon or whatever. And so if we display the contents of the output file that is produced by this check, we can see that this particular neuron morphology, it passed the check, first of all. So it has an axon, it has basal dendrite, it has epical dendrites, and also all the segments are non-zero and they have non-zero radii. So now we can get the basic statistics uh, using the uh, neuron stats command line option which will show what are the branch orders for uh, each substructure of a neuron. Basically, the branch order is how many children at most uh, uh, does this branch have. So next, to understand the structure of our neuron, we would want to plot a dendrogram. This is how we do it in this cell. And uh, we see that the axon uh, marked with blue is very long and branchy structure. And we have one axon, as we expect. We have one uh, epical, oh yeah, one epical dendrite and two basal dendrites, so, which is what we expect to have for, for a pyramidal neuron. So now let's plot the actual neuron morphology. And this is how it looks like. We see this lone axon and all this branchy uh, dendrite structure. 
Right. Now, if we want to save um, our figure as a PNG, we specify oh, the output directory. And then using one of the utils function from this package, we save the plot in our home directory. And here, um, the workshop directory should have created for you. And if you go into it, you will find a figure.png, which will be the saved figure of this neuron morphology. We can even plot it in 3D. Here I show how to do it, but be careful with these limits. I did it manually, but you can find a better way to specify them. Um, let me also go through the quantitative characteristics that you can get from the SWC file. So we can count the neurites that are in the neuron, their total depth, heights, and widths, um, then total lengths of the neurites, and total volume and surface area. So here we see that we have 89 bifurcation points, which is quite a lot. So yeah, we see the branchy structure, which kind of corresponds to this number of bifurcation points. And uh, also we see that the maximum branch order is 18. So at most the um, leaves of the trees, so to say they will have the order of 18 and the bounding box for the new one. So that's the very basic analysis that, and visualization that we can do for neuron tracings. And before I head over to another notebook, are there any questions about this neuron morphologies? Okay, perfect. Then let's go to the second notebook, uh, which is called Cell Finder. And it is called after the package that we will be using. It's the Python package called Cell Finder that has three tools in one. Basically, it detects the cells in the whole brain. Um, then it registers the whole brain image into the common coordinates framework, which is also known as the Atlas. And then it also performs the cell classification, but we will omit this step because it can take a lot of time. Um, so what I want you to do is to go to run and again, run all cells. And again, once you get to the point where all of the imports were successful here and you get a number for this output and no errors, please put the thumbs up. And please somebody track the thumbs up. And if you have any problems, please let us know, please unmute. Um, so the cell finder package, let me quickly and show it to you. Any help mm -hmm. anything you need to get back so it's all open source packages that I'm using. So they are available at GitHub and they have very nice documentation. So Cell Finder first detects the bright spots in the image. It first does it in each C section of it and then does the 3D volumetric filtering uh, to make sure that we detect each cell only once, not in every adjacent uh, Z plane. So this is how the cell detection looks like. And we see that we detected some artifacts here, which are not true cells. And then the subsequent cell classification will remove these artifacts. Yeah, but we're not running it today because it takes considerable time. And then um, the volume gets registered to the Atlas so that we can, and it, it gets registered backwards and uh, forward so that we can overlay the Atlas annotation on the raw data and tell at which specific regions these cells reside. So let me go back and see if we have any thumbs up for the imports of the second notebook. Any troubles, any errors? Okay, I hope that everybody's following. If you're just listening, you can put, yeah, thanks, Peter. You can also put the thumbs up if you're just listening. All right. So what's happening here? Uh, first of all, we have a whole brain image, which was downsampled for the sake of speed. Uh, this brain image was obtained by the STPT technique, which is the serial to photon tomography. It's one of the pa Pavel Austin's data sets. Uh, I downsampled it in the lateral dimension 10 times. And now the voxel spacing is 50 micron in actual direction and in lateral direction 10 by 10. Um, so the original image was a couple uh, hundreds of gigabytes and this image is smaller that we will be registering. 
And here I'm specifying the required parameters for cell detection. Uh, the cell finder library that you just installed, it comes with the um, command line tool, which is very well described in the documentation. Let me show you. And there is also a tutorial for how to use this package. Um, so the computation can be found here. I also put the link into the notebook itself. And so uh, at this Brain Globe website, you have all the packages developed by Brain Globe community, which are all open source and they are all well documented and brain related and easy to use. So the cell finder has the tutorial, which describes the usage uh, for the command line tool. Uh, but I wanted to make it easier, easier adjustable. So all the parameters are specified here. And then we just mm, read the image with the TIFF file library, which is already installed at Bill. And then we just send all these parameters to the main function of the cell finder. So we can easily tweak all these numbers and see how they affect the output. Um, there is a quite a lot of output at this cell where detection happens. So if you want to clear that output so that's easier to scroll the notebook, you just right click and select clear output. And now all the output is gone, but the variable that contains detected cell uh, is still there. So here I have a little example of how would I would use it uh, as a command line tool. And all these options can be seen if you call cell finder dash dash help. Mm -hmm. So the detected cells are basically a list of 625,000 cells and each cell is some weird class. And then if we want to see what exactly these objects have, we can use the Python introspection tools. So we can go, go and type dear of cell. Cell is the first element of this list and let's see what it has. So it has all these methods and attributes. And for example, we have the coordinates here, which we can extract and proceed with. We transform coordinates to the NumPy array. If you're not familiar with NumPy, it's the numerical Python library that is heavily used by the scientific community. It's basically the C structures for Python, which is very high performance. And so we save these coordinates in the NumPy array. And now we have the shape of, of this 625,000 with three coordinates each. And we also save it to the CSV file. I'll show you later why, because we will be visualizing this same thing in Napari. So for now, we are visualizing the output in the Jupyter Notebook. And here I selected the Z layer 116, but you can play with this number. You can specify a different layer number and see how detections look at the layer 40 or the layer 150 and so on. So basically these green um, circles are locations of the detected cells, but these cells were detected just at this Z plane. So some other cells are not highlighted here because they were just detected at the other Z plane. So their center, centroid is located at another Z layer. So what can we do with all these cell locations and how can we understand which structures they belong to? For this, we will use the image registration um, and the package that I will be using is called BrainRidge, but first let me explain what the atlas is. So there are a number of atlases and the golden standard, of course, is the Allen Brain Atlas. And to access all this variety of atlases, the Brain Globe people, the same people as who developed the Cell Finder package, they developed the Brain Globe Atlas API, which I'm using here, and it got installed together with the Cell Finder. So for me, it shows that two atlases are available locally. For you, it will probably be just Allen Mouse 100 micron, which we will be using for the registration. It's the lower resolution atlas, but it works very fast with it. So just for the sake of the demonstration, we will use this atlas. But here are the multitude of atlases that are available through the Brain Globe Atlas API. There are human brain atlases, zebrafish, developing mouse, the spinal cord atlas, and a lot. And they are all um, produced in the way so that they're accessed in the same exact way through the same API, which is very convenient. 
And so if we leverage this uh, Python API, we have the uniform set of attributes and methods that each of these atlases has. So for example, we can get the mask for a specific structure. We can get the ancestors for a specific structure because uh, the atlas is labeled in a tree-like or graph-like uh, you know, structure. So basically each, um, each region has its parents or its ancestors, and this helps visualize it. So let me print some basic attributes of the atlas. So here is the shape in pixels, shape in microns, atlas resolution, which we expect to be 100 microns, and the atlas orientation. So if we plot the atlas.reference, it will be the reference image to which we are going to register our raw data. So we are making our raw data looking as similar as possible to this reference image so that we can directly map each region uh, which is segmented for the reference image to our raw data. And this is the goal of the registration. So this is the annotation made by experts, every point in the brain in their um, re Atlas reference image maps to a specific brain region. And we can trust this segmentation. That's why we're using it for our raw data after the registration. So now we understand what Atlas is. And we are going to use the brain reg, which has the documentation on the link here and the tutorial. Uh, we will use brain reg to register our um, raw image to the Atlas reference image. So we specify the mandatory parameters, which is the orientation, voxel spacing, and we specify the output. So the registration output will be at your home directory a uh, workshop folder and registration folder inside the workshop folder. Here I outlined all the parameters used in the registration. These are default values, but you can tweak them and see how it affects the registration. Again, brain rage also comes as the, sorry, as the command line tool. And I have an example how to use it as a command line tool. Or you can see all the options by running, sorry, I forgot the exclamation mark, brain reg dash, dash dash help. But here we're using just the main function imported from the brain reg uh, Python package so that we can easily tweak these parameters and supply them into this function. So registration took just half a minute, probably. And um, let's examine the output directory. We have it at workshop folder registration. And here we have um, the image downsample.tip, which is the downsampled version of our raw data. And then uh, downsample standard.tip is our raw data worked into the Atlas space. Then registered atlas.tip is the Atlas segmentation, that colorful image that I showed you before, but worked into the space of our raw data. So just to overlay the structure segmentation on our data and say specifically where the cells reside. So now if we plot that, we will read the downsampled image, uh, this one. We will read the Atlas registered Atlas image, which is this one. And then we overlay one on top of the other using matplotlib. But again, I will show you in the section about Napari how it looks like for the whole brain in Napari. It looks much more interesting than this. And so we can also change the layer that we are plotting at the moment and see how it looks at different one we choose. Let's by 70. So this is how the registration looks like, and we see that it was quite good. I had at one of the last or last year's workshops the more detailed um, video and a notebook about the registration, and it is available at our brain image library GitHub. Let me show you real quick. Brain image library. Oh. So in the workshops folder. In the previous year's workshop, I have these two notebooks where we registered the FMOST fluorescence microoptical section and tomography data set. This is the multi terabyte uh, data set that we first had to downsample and um, 
make it fit into the memory for the registration. And then at the second step, we registered that image to the Atlas and we took the high resolution points from the full resolution data set and transformed that using the deformation fields into the Atlas space. So if you're interested, the notebooks are here and the videos are at the brain image library, um, the brain image library org website at the data submission training so here we have the recordings of previous workshops and hopefully we'll have the recordings of this, this workshop here as well and that's it for the on demand do you have any other questions about this very able to follow thanks Okay, so I guess, is, are we having a break now? Yeah, thank you, Yana. Um, thanks everyone for following along. Yeah, we have a, a break scheduled here from two to 2.15, so uh, we can reconvene here um, 15 after two, um, and we'll discuss a little bit about the analysis ecosystem and some um, visualization that you can do now and, and some things that you can expect um, in, in the future. Um, see you then. All right. Hi, folks. Welcome back. Um, apologies. I'm having some issues sharing my screen. Zoom wants to quit on me. Let me give this another try. All right. If there's a someone can give me a thumbs up and let me know if you're able to see the, the calendar it says today. All right. Perfect. Thanks, Matt. Um, okay, well, everybody, welcome back to the second half of, of the second session of our, our bill workshop. Um, as you can see, uh, what I want to talk about in the second half um, is sort of a, a brief primer on some of the visualization um, that we can support here at Bill. Uh, the first part that I'm going to talk about is going to be sort of a hybrid of things that are available now and things that I expect to be available very shortly um, within the next couple of months. And then um, with regards specifically to NeuroGlancer here on the list. Um, then I'm gonna pass it off to uh, Yana again, who's gonna talk a bit about uh, the Napari visualization that um, we've made available. And, and some of this is, is currently available to you and is something you can work with immediately. Um, but also we're continuing to build functionality into that Napari uh, plugin, and she'll tell you a bit more about that. And then we'll hand it off to Ivan Kalberg, who will talk a bit about uh, using X2Go um, and a number of visualization tools that we can use inside X2Go um, in the um, using Bill hardware. And then, of course, he'll also talk a bit about um, Slurm and some of the modules that are available to us. Um, so I, I just want to start by saying, you know, we have a, a number of visualization tools available. The, the main tool, uh, which is something you can use 
on your computer or laptop currently is a uh, Napari Build Data Viewer plugin um, that we're developing. In fact, CZI is actually funding this as a part of the grant that is listed here. And thanks to Yana's hard work, um, we have over 100 uh, brains currently represented in that Napari Build Data Viewer. Uh, she'll give you a primer a bit later on exactly how you would go about installing it and interacting with it. Um, but this is just a little video to kind of show you what's available. Um, and, and so you can do this immediately, and, and we're continuing to build functionality into the application, and she'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, actually, I will tell you that, that one of the bits of functionality we're starting to build into this now is, is being able to visualize SWC files. Now, this is something that is, is currently in development, and I would expect that certainly by the end of the year, we're going to have some basic functionality for visualizing SWC files, uh, as you saw earlier in the Jupyter Notebook demonstration, but obviously here in the PARI and ideally overlaid on the um, data sets in which um, they are specifically associated with and annotate. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what's coming. So uh, for over a year now, um, we've been developing uh, a method to make the, the relatively diverse number of data sets that we have at Brain Image Library available, um, and ideally available in a way that is, is most useful to the end user. Uh, so we're building, what we did is we proposed in our renewal, um, which started a, um, earlier uh, last year, um, we proposed to do something that we called an on-demand transformer. Uh, to give you an idea of, of what we mean by this is that we can take data that reside um, on bill um, file servers and we can basically serve those data out to um, either folks who are computing bill side or over the internet in, in various formats. Uh, the reason we care to do this is that we have a lot of data at bill. Currently um, over five petabytes of whole brain imaging data um, we're expecting in the next year to start getting multi-petabyte size brains, and, and the expectations are that the bill um, archive will grow to at least 50 petabytes in the next five years. And so storing multiple representations of these different data sets is, is really not feasible um, for us to do. And, and so uh, we look to provide a way that we can give flexibility to the community, um, but also, um, you know, serve out, but also be uh, efficient bill side and serve out the data in, in ways that are useful. So for instance, um, what we're doing is we're making an effort to save data bill side in these multi-scale and dimensional data sets. Uh, primarily, we're using um, an OME czar base, but there's also the ability to use HDF5 based formats and, and, and other formats to confirm, conform to this idea of an n dimensional um, multi scale data set that is um, uh, based on chunks so that we can actually read um, defined small regions of the data set at multiple scales and, and serve those dynamically. All of that will run through a, a set of servers um, served out by an application that we're developing that we call Brain API. Um, and we'll have the ability to actually use um, these same Brain API interfaces locally to compute on bill hardware, but we'll also be able to dynamically make requests to Brain API over web servers and then serve out raw NumPy arrays, for instance, for applications in Python and perhaps Napari. Um, but we'll also be able to serve out um, properly formed OME czar, neuroglance or pre-computed, or if you want to say download a defined TIFF or JPEG image, or even a TIFF stack of a whole data set that will be available to you as well. And you know, presumably any um, data sets that conform to this kind of multi-scale chunked array could also be dynamically served uh, as well. So you know, the idea here is is twofold right we're we're going to talk about this in the context of visualization but it's really about the ability to um interact with the data so the idea that we can make these very arbitrary requests at the voxel level we can get anything from an individual voxel to potentially an entire data set uh using this um same API interface and at any scale 
that um, we would wish to request. And the idea would be, right, that we can use this as a data delivery service. It can be delivered to, say, Napari or NeuroGlancer for visualization, but we can also deliver the data to some sort of computational infrastructure. So we have a, um, we're currently in the process of converting legacy data sets um, into a multi-scale omezar like array. Um, the reason is, is that uh, in the legacy data have often been given to Bill in quite a variety of data sets. Um, most uh, appreciably has been um, in the, uh, you know, in a, uh, uh, multi um, individual TIFFs um, that are uh, representing Z planes of uh, multiple colors. This is, for instance, these fluorescence micro optical sectioning tomography data sets, which are about 25 terabytes a piece. Um, each of them represent a single TIFF for a single Z layer and a single color. Um, this is also very similar to the way in which these uh, single two photon tomography and light sheet data sets have been given to us. And we're expecting in the next uh, year to receive as much as five whole brain human data sets uh, that will comprise about two, um, possibly three petabytes a piece. And so the ability to actually serve these data out in multiple formats becomes very important. Um, also that we ideally don't have to duplicate um, data. Unfortunately for the legacy data sets, we are going to go through a conversion process where voxel by voxel, each of these data sets will be converted to an OMEZR. We expect for um, ideally, uh, data sets um, that have not yet landed at Bill, um, we're going to start asking that people either provide us with data sets that can easily be converted to an OMEZAR, or in the case of the Hollis project, which uh, is a direct collaborator of ours, we will probably be putting the data in a format that can be referenced uh, quite directly like an OMEZAR. For those of you who aren't familiar with OMEZAR, um, it is a file format that the uh, community has really started to um, uh, appreciate and, and use quite heavily. And so if you aren't familiar with OMEZAR and want to become more familiar with it, um, I would suggest this uh, recent preprint that's available that's shown here. Um, Bill has a, a specific portion of this uh, paper in which we talk about uh, the on-demand transformer and our desire to be able to serve OMEZAR dynamically. Um, Matt McCormick, who's actually on the call here today, is also an author on this paper, and he's a really excellent resource when it comes to uh, um, information about OMEZAR and conversion tools and the like. Okay, so I, I, unfortunately, I wanted to be able to give links to everybody today so they could also play with uh, NeuroGlancer, but we still have some security work to do um, behind the firewall here at um, Brain Image Library, and so we haven't been able to make these links available to uh, the public yet, but I expect that in the next uh, month to two months, um, you'll be able to come to the Brain Image Library and on um, as we build these uh, multi-representation um, data sets, you'll be able to click individual links and get NeuroGlancer windows and be able to browse through the data. Uh, what we're expecting this to look like is something like this, um, where you can come and see light sheet imaging data, um, uh, confocal imaging data. Here's a, a 25 terabyte FMOS data set, and then here's a um, two photon tomography data set. And so you'll be able to very fluidly uh, browse through these data um, using um, NeuroGlancer. Just a uh, demo of what that might look like is um, this here, where using a single click, um, we're able to open up uh, a NeuroGlancer window and be able to interact here with this 25 terabyte um, FMOS data set that you see here. Um, the nice thing about this, right, is that you have access to the full resolution data. Um, and it's something that you can do um, sitting on your couch at home, right, um, on, on your laptop under uh, a, a normal home internet connection. So you can have access to these data, you can visualize and understand these data um, with the tools that we have available to us. It actually works even reasonably well on a smartphone. So as, as we build out, so, so the functionality here for NeuroGlancer is, is really dependent on this ability to serve out these multi-scale chunked data sets. And so we're also building uh, the ability to serve out uh, data to other applications like Napari, for instance, just to bring this full circle. Um, one of the things that we're looking to incorporate into the Napari plugin, although it is not available yet, 
um, our uh, single click access to um, hundreds and hopefully eventually thousands of individual um, full resolution data sets. So you can install Napari, which uh, Yana will demonstrate for you here shortly. Um, and then you'll be able to um, designate any one of these um, full resolution data sets and, and seamlessly browse through it. The last thing I want to make a point of is, is not to think of this as just a way to visualize the data, but ultimately it will be a way for us to even access the data programmatically. So here is just kind of an example uh, script of how we would um, interact with a an FMOS data set. We you know, get the FMOS data set and then we can actually call up um, specific pixel coordinates within multiple resolution versions of the um, data set. And you can see that we can extract on the right here an individual neuron at multiple scales. And so this will be something that ultimately you'll be able to interact with um, an SDK like this, um, bill side or remotely in order to um, interact with all of the data sets that we have available. Um, with that, I'm going to turn this over to Yana, who is going to give you a demonstration and talk a little bit more about the specifics of the Napari plugin that's being developed. Thank you, Alan. It's always a pleasure to talk about Napari. Let me share my screen. So we are at the Napari.org website, and uh, this is the website describing this amazing viewer, and it has tutorials and documentation and the community links. So if you never used Napari before, I really encourage you to do so. So it's developed for both people who don't know anything about programming and also for people who are very experienced with Python. So let me go ahead and try installing Napari following the instructions that are given on the Napari GitHub. I just copied this. And Please note that I need to have Miniconda or Anaconda installed to be able to follow these instructions from GitHub. And that's why I'm not showing the whole process because it can take considerable time to install Anaconda or Miniconda. But I already have it available. You can see this by the space environment activated. So I just paste this links and it should just work for me. So the value of Napari is the community around it. So community regularly contributes hundreds of plugins and it's in active development and you can find plugins for everything in addition to what Napari sports out of the box. Okay, so I created the environment and now I'm installing Napari and I'm doing it locally uh, to, for the sake of showing the plugin that uh, Alan described before, because it makes sense to use it on your laptop, as Alan said, on the couch, having a coffee and browsing this multi terabyte data sets. So this plugin that we are developing for Bill, it doesn't require you to have an, an account to access the data. And it's just a single click, easily usable tool for you to, to interact with the data. Okay, so I installed Napari. And the easiest way to start is, is just typing the party, but also you can start it from within Python, from within Jupyter Notebook, or there are different ways to start it from the command line. And here's the interface that we have. So we have an IPython console here. Um, we have the layer tools. Let me show an actual image loaded to Napari. I, we can load as many Napari instances as we want. Uh, as, as much as our memory allows, of course. And um, this is the image layer, the, the brain that I was doing self-detection and registration on. So now you can appreciate that this is the full brain. So we can go all the way from anterior to posterior and examine different layers. So I'm just using this scroll here to go between the C layers and uh, I can use the mouse wheel to zoom in and out. So these are layer controls here. I can uh, toggle the visibility of the layer and I can adjust the contrast. I can do some gamma correction. I can choose a beautiful color map. Mm, and choose different interpolations option. Uh, so now let's actually load what we created by cell detection. If you remember, we saved our cells as a CSV and the bar understands the CSVs right out of the box. So I just drag the CSV onto the viewer. 
And here are the cells that we detected. So they are um, denoted by little circles here. And we can go ahead and see that the cells were detected in the whole volume. And as you see, it added another layer, which is the points layer type. So now if I go to my IPython console, we have a variable called viewer always available in here. And so the viewer has the layers attribute. And we can see all the layers that are currently here. So in this case, it's a list of two layers, the image layer and the points layer. So here are the controls of the points layer. I highlight the points layer and I get access to these controls. So I can select specific subset of points or select all the points at this currency layer and I can change their shape. For example, I can make them greens. I can change their color. I can also change their size and I can show out of slice detection so that we can see that actually there are many more cells than we see in each individual Z layer. So this was the points layer. And now let me show you the results of our registration that we did in the no notebooks. So here we have our downsampled raw image. Give it some time to load. Okay, we will adjust the contrast. It's a low resolution image because we were downsampling to 100 micron voxel spacing. And now we can overlay the registered atlas on top of it. So now we see all these annotations. We can change blending to additive to see better both layers at the same time. We can change the opacity of this layer. This is a labels layer, so-called. So it's usually used for the segmentation. And every single pixel or voxel in this case uh, represents a number that is shown in the lower left corner when I point to it. And this number corresponds to the brain structure. So again, I can go from anterior to posterior so that you can appreciate that the registration was successful. And the last layer that I didn't cover is the shapes layer. So I can draw some basic shape, uh, for example, a polygon around the brain. Sorry, it will be probably very ugly because I'm doing it quick. So this is how you can create shapes to identify some regions of interest. And then you press escape to close this polygon. Mm. So now, if you don't have the functionality that you want directly in Napari, you have all this multitude of plugins available to you. So you can go to Napari Hub and search for the plugins that you might find useful. For example, if you want to visualize some specific file format such as Imaris, Let's search what's available. OK, there is Napari Maris Loader, developed by Alan Watson in this call. <laughs> so the plugin that I want to talk next, it's the Napari Build Data Viewer. And you just type Build in this search. And here it is. It's the first result, again, developed by Alan Watson. And if we go to this page of the plugin, we can see how to install it, how to use it. Basically, there is a video showing you so I'll just go ahead and copy this. You've installed the Ferry Build Data Viewer. Um, let me find the console. Okay, so I'm installing the Napari Build Data Viewer through PIP, but I'll also show you the way how to install it from within the Napari GUI. Okay, so this is Napari. We go to plugins and here is our plugin available. So to install and uninstall plugins, you go to this submenu and here you also can type build, uh, but it's already installed because I installed it through here. Okay, sorry, took some time. My GPU probably is very busy. <laughs> 
So let's now try to load some data set using this plugin. It's very easy. So we have a drop down menu with 192 data sets currently. And we just let's click and try the first one. And in the meantime, I'll show you which data sets are currently available through this plugin. So basically, these are all FMOS data sets for whom there were downsampled representations. So if I go to the Brain Image Library search tool, Brain Inventory, and I select the technique FMOST, not FMOST neuron morphology, just FMOST. So I see a bunch of data sets come up. And this first data set right here, for example, uh, the name of the data set in that menu, in the dropdown, will be this last part of this path. So let's go ahead and see how this data set looks in the viewer. So I already have it loaded in 3D here. So you can see that this data set that I was just showing you at the Bill website. So it's the same number. So it starts with mouse ID underscore 367667. Yeah, 367667. OK. So this is the 3D representation of it. You can appreciate what's in there. And to toggle between the 3D and 2D, I press this button here. And now I'm in 2D. And I can also scroll between the layers and see the beautiful neuron morphologies there. So that's the quick and easy way to visualize data sets at Bill. And I'll stop sharing now. If you have any questions, please let me know. I see the question from Matt. Is there a way to filter, find data sets that have metadata to metadata? Mariah, probably it's a question to you. Um, I think the best way to access that right now is um, through the CSV download that's available on the um, website that includes everything that's in metadata one and metadata two. Um, and if there is a DOI issued for those data sets, um, then that would be available on doi.brainimagelibrary.org. Um, that includes all the metadata. It's um, We are working though on making that search a little bit easier. <laughs> Got it, thank you. Okay, if there are no other questions, I'll hand it over to Ivan to talk about X2Go. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. I'm using two different computers. That's why I'm trying to make sure kind of be presenting on one and talking on the other. So let me put on chat. Um, in my case, I don't have a presentation. I have a document. So I'm going to share the link right now on chat. Please let me know that you can access this document. Why can I? Am I having technical issues? Can you hear me? Oh, yes. I'm having a technical issue and I'm trying to figure out what it is. Okay, there we go. So I copied a link and that link contains basically a step-by-step -step, a description of the exercise that I'm gonna be doing today. Um, so like um, Alan was saying, I was gonna show you some tools, um, but I'm gonna flip it. I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about Slurm and, and LMOD very quickly. And then I'm gonna start with X2Go. Um, I, I wanna show you something that uh, might make your life easier at the very beginning. I do have some exercises some visualization on the document that I shared with you, but um, more than likely, I'm gonna show you a couple of examples on how to use Slurm and open on demand to submit some some very simple scripts to uh, the scheduler. Okay, so let me start by sharing my screen. 
Okay, so this is the document. Can everyone see the document like this when they click on it? Yes. Okay, good. So the first thing that I want to talk to you about was kind of like a very quick summary of some of the things we talked since yesterday. Basically, you have access to the data that is being hosted on Bill, uh, the public data, and you have access to the data that you put in the landing zone as long, along with your projects. But you also have some resources that you can use to access your data or to do some computing on your data. So I just wanted to recap a couple of things. The login uh, address is for you to log in into our system. It is not meant for computation. So please avoid do any kind of computation there. You know, you can do lightweight editing, editing of files, but if you're doing something that requires a lot of memory or course, please avoid using that. The next level is the workshop VM, which is what we've been using, um, which is a large memory node. Uh, the only issue with the workshop VM is that even though it's a large resource, it's not distributed, meaning that we're sort of all competing for the resources at the same time. You cannot allocate or partition the resources of the workshop VM. And then we set, we have a set of uh, large memory nodes, which we call the L nodes, uh, which those we can partition in pieces that do not compete with each other. So you can request an allocation for your computation. And that allocation that you receive for your computation will not be shared with any other uh, users. And lastly, we have a, a GPU enabled um, compute node, but that compute node is uh, only available upon request. Um, and at the moment, uh, it's only a limited set of users that's access to it. In the future, we're gonna um, open it a little bit more. Okay, so that's the recap. Now, Mariah already talked to you about how to connect to the workshop VM, um, how to SSH. Uh, Luke already talked to you about this yesterday, but I wanted to show you a different way to connect to the workshop VM, okay? Uh, so everyone can please start their X2Go, okay? So I'm gonna show you how to start a terminal on X2Go, and there's a reason for that, okay? So just start X2Go, and just like uh, everybody else did before, please do hands up or to let me know that you are, um, you're following what I'm doing. And if I'm going too fast, just uh, feel, feel free to, to let me know. Okay, so we're gonna open X2Go. And then what we're gonna do is to create a new session. Yesterday, you created a session to connect to the workshop VM, but now we're gonna create a different kind of session. So I'm just gonna go here. And again, remember, all of these steps are described in the document. And we're gonna create a new session. And you're gonna see exactly the same screens you saw yesterday. Is everybody here? Yes? By the way, can you see my screen properly? Yes, I think so, right? Okay, good. So this session, I'm gonna call it applications. However, the rest of this form is gonna remain similar. So my host is gonna be workshop. Uh, Brain image library org. My login is your username, and that in my case is my username. And the main difference between what you did yesterday and today is that at the bottom, instead of selecting Mate, which is what we did yesterday, we're going to select single application. And once we select that, here you're going to see this drop down list to the right, and we're going to select terminal. Once you're done, just click OK. Is everybody following me so far? I'm gonna take the silence and say yes, okay? So um, I'm just gonna click OK. And now you're gonna see here to my right, I have a new box that says applications. Actually, since I'm, more, I'm on two different computers, I should be able to see if anyone has a question. Chat. Okay, no questions. Okay, good. So now I'm just gonna click application and it should ask for my login. And I'm just gonna enter the login like you did yesterday. Okay, now if you remember when you started using X2Go yesterday, it will open a remote desktop connection with a full desktop. But when you're doing this, it will only open a terminal. Why is this important? Well, if you wanna use uh, a full desktop, clearly what we did yesterday was okay, 
But if you just want to use a single application and your connection is not very stable, it is better to use, use, uh, use it this way to just open a terminal. Because the functionality of the terminal will also allow you to um, open files and start applications and do editing. So this is where we start. By the way, it takes about a minute to start. So let's be patient. Is everyone following me? No? Yes? Sometimes I feel like someone is saying like, no, no, but. I had a quick uh, yes. comment. So under the connecting to workshop, you have brainimagelibrary.edu. So you probably just want to update that to uh, .org. I did .org. Did I tap edu? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I'll update that on the document. Oh, no worries. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, markdown, yeah. Okay, so this, you'll see that I have a terminal on screen. This terminal is now a terminal that was open on X2Go. It is not the terminal from your desktop, okay? So whatever we do here, it's actually running on, on the workshop VM. So let's keep working on this terminal. So the two tools that I wanted to talk to you today, and I'm gonna be very, uh, very brief about these. The first one is called LMOD. And the second one is called Slurm. Maybe you're already familiar with both. These are very standard tools used in HPC. Um, and the first one we call LMOD, uh, we use it to load into our workspace different pieces of software. This is especially useful when you have different versions of the same software. Uh, there's You can find tutorials online that will show you how to use both. Uh, very thoroughly, but this document is very straightforward with the most simple cases so that you can navigate our resources. So the first thing you can do is do module avail. And if you do module avail, it will list all of the software that is installed in our infrastructure that it's available to you. If you ever have a request for a piece of software that it's not here, you can send an email to build support and we'll get it installed. At the moment, the only piece of commercial software that we have available on Bill, it is it's MATLAB. So you can put a request to get added to the MATLAB uh, licensing, and then we can give you access to MATLAB. If you own the license to a particular software and you want us to install it, just again, send an email to Bill support and we will try to make it happen. But most of the software that we have available, it has been requested by a user or we feel like, um, it could be useful for your research. Mostly we have Anaconda as our main Python distribution. We have MATLAB, Julia, Java, and some other, um, some other programming languages available through modules. So the way that you use a module is, for example, you can see that I have one version of MATLAB installed here, which is, oh, well, actually I have two. My default version of MATLAB is 2021A. So if I do which MATLAB, you're going to notice that it's not going to find a binary. But if I were to do module load MATLAB, and in this case, 2021A, it's going to load it. And now MATLAB, it's available on my path. So now I am ready to use MATLAB in this session. You have to use LMOD every time you start a new session. If you're writing your own scripts, then at the top of your scripts, you're supposed to add this command so that your script knows what version of the software it needs to load, okay? Uh, that being said, you can unload MATLAB or any other module just by typing the unload command, okay? At the same time, you can use some of the software that has a UI to just do some inspection of data. We're not gonna do it today, but for example, we have Fiji. So I could do module load Fiji. And then to start it, I think it's just Fiji, right? Now, if I do that, it's gonna take a minute, but it should start the Fiji UI. So the main difference is that if you use your X2Go terminal, the way that I showed you in the documentation, then you can use UI applications, applications with UIs that exist on the workshop VM. 
And that, of course, includes Fiji, MADLAB, Elastic. Uh, I think we have Bot 3D. We have uh, a couple of more applications that do require UI. Of course, you can do something different. See, now I have here on the top of my screen, I have my, I have my uh, Fiji that I can use to explore. These images are not yours, these are mine. But um, you can, let's see if I have, these are not brain images, so I'm not gonna show them. Let's see if there's anything that I can show. Oh, there you go. What happened? Did it go away? Did it do something dumb? Oh no, there you go. So now this is an example of an image uh, that it's loaded from my um, from my desktop application. So the good thing about doing this is that you can do your processing either on terminal, on batch, you can use it on open on demand as well through Jupyter or R, and then you can use your connection to X2Go to do some exploration on your data, okay? So again, the main reason why we set up terminal on X2Go is to be able to open uh, applications that have a UI. Okay, so I'm just gonna quit. And basically we're done with starting up visual applications, but we're gonna keep using this, okay? So just don't close it for now, just leave it open. Um, and now we're gonna go back to the, to the browser and we're gonna go to open on demand. Okay, but remember, don't close that terminal. We're gonna use it a little bit later. Okay, so everyone please go to ondemand.brainimagelibrary.org, uh, log in until you see this page. And then when you are here, please raise your hands so that I know we're all in the same place. I hope I see the little hands raised. I don't see anyone with your hands raised. Okay, so if you remember from the previous session when Yana was showing you the, the her notebooks, she asked you to put a reservation for eight hours. So now we can go to um, interactive apps. And I mean, to this little corner here, you see that little square? If you click it, it should show you all of the sessions that you have open. And there should be one that looks like this in green. Do you see it? If you do, then you can activate it by clicking connect to Jupiter. Okay. And I clicked and it will open a new browser and it will take me to the session that was open before. Now you wait a minute. And this is the session that we had before. In my case, my left right side looks a little bit different because um, my, my, my user space is different than yours, okay? And if you remember by the example that you were doing with Yana, you open a Jupyter notebook or you created a notebook here, right? By clicking this button. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna do two things. We're gonna open terminal and it will open something like this. And then we're gonna click this button, again, the plus button here at the top left, and we're gonna open text file because I wanna open a text file and it will open a text editor. By the way, you don't need to do this here. You can use Nano, VI, Emacs, or whatever text editor that you prefer on terminal, but I'm doing it this way just because it will be easier to show you, okay? So, if we go back to my document and we're gonna go back to, to the bottom, there was a request from Katie yesterday to show how to, um, how to use some of the temporary spaces that we have on, on Bill, okay? So basically you can submit your jobs to a scheduler, the scheduler that we call Slurm, and you can partition the space so that you can, allocate some resources and exploit those resources the best that you can. But by using those resources, you also have special 
access to uh, temporary folders with faster IO. And that's what I'm gonna be talking about next. Uh, so let's see, we have our exercises. The first one, it's opening an image. That's the, that's the one I was showing you before, but I opened a different image. Um, you can take a look. Then there's another exercise about using Napari on, or at least opening Napari on Bill. Um, again, here are the structures of how to do it. Uh, but basically it's very similar to what uh, Yana was talking about. It's just that we provide an environment. And then I'm gonna go to extracting files. And we're gonna, we're gonna take a look at this particular example, okay? If you look at this particular script, all it's doing, it's downloading a zip file from the web and then it's decompressing that zip file. There's really nothing too fascinating about it. Download, decompress, and then erase. Now the issue with this, and this is a dummy example, of course, is that some of the compressed files that you're gonna be uploading to the landing zone, they're either gonna be large, they're gonna be highly compressed, or they're gonna be a mixture of both. Okay, so the, the question is, can we upload compressed files to the landing zone and then decompress ourselves as data providers? The short answer is yes. But then the, the question that we have is, where is it better to decompress these files? So that's what we're gonna be talking about next. So as part of any infrastructure, and this applies to both the workshop VM and all of the other resources that we have available on Bill, you have access to a folder called TMP, okay? And that is available on every machine. Don't use TMP, okay? Never use it. It is not safe in the sense that your files can go away at any minute, and it's not a really large space for doing any kind of computation. So what we do provide for you, it's at different locations to do this. The first one, it's called local, okay? And local, it's a specific random partition or space on disk that gets allocated per job. So what I mean is that when you use the scheduler to request an allocation, um, you are gonna get a space on local. So if you look at my screen, I'm gonna type the first slurm command. And the first one is says here. When I run this, I should see most of you here. And I see you because, right? Um, right, like Peter is here and, and, and they're located in L001 and some are on L002, okay? Is everyone here seeing this screen so far? Yeah, yes? I'm sorry to interrupt. I think Matt has a question. Feel free just to let you, Matt, and, and ask. Is there a way to filter find it? No, is that the question? Oh, sorry, I was just raising my hand because I'm, th I'm there with you, I'm following. Okay, okay, okay. So for example, I am located in L002. So I should be able to SSH into L002 with my password, but only because I have an allocation and you're gonna see that there should exist a folder called local. And that folder has Slurm jobs. That specific Slurm job is a space created for me for each of those jobs. So there's a guarantee that when you are running a job and you submit it to a scheduler, you're gonna get a random location where you can write to disk. And you can consider this a temporary space in the same way that TMP is with the exception that slash local is much larger. So you can put, I don't want to say a limited number of files, but let's say theoretically as much as you can. The slash local space goes away the moment your job stops. So you can use this as a temporary space while your job is running, but as soon as your job stops, that space gets erased. So if you're writing to that space, make sure to remove the files from that location if they're important before your job starts. The only issue is that slash local shouldn't be any faster in theory than writing to your home directory. So it's a separate space, but you're not getting any improvement in IO, okay? So if we go back to the document, 
and we talk go back to the same script, you're going to notice that below I have an example here where it's writing to slash local because it knows that I will get a space on local. So in this case, I am creating a temporary folder called images two. I am downloading my tarball there, my zip file. I am decompressing it, that local folder, temp folder. And then at the end of my job, I am moving it back in this case to the desktop. So let's do that. I'm gonna copy this whole thing, this script here, just copy. I'm gonna go back to Jupyter Lab. And remember that I created an empty, an empty text file. I'm just gonna paste everything here. And I'm gonna save this. I'm gonna control S to save. And I'm gonna call it tutorial1.sh. And now I have my, my script. Well, in this case, I should have said something. I went to my desktop and I created the folder set. And in this case, I have a zip folder. Mine is populated with files. Yours should be empty. And that is where I'm storing my tutorial one script. Okay. And again, what this job is doing with this script is just creating my a folder in my in my temp directory. Remember, there's no there's no performance in using slash local, but it's a temp space created just for you. And I'm downloading that zip file and I'm decompressing and then I'm moving back from there to here. There's really no benefit in doing this. Uh, it just helps you keep organized. Uh, by the way, this same rule applies to Bridges2 and Neocortex. So you always get slash local in any of the jobs that you submit a PSC. And in this case, you're gonna notice these three lines on top. And what these three lines tell you is that it gives the scheduler the options on, on where to put this um, job. So the first one is compute because that is the name of the queue or the partition that you as users can submit. That's the only one you have access to. This is the default one as well. Little n4 means assign for course for this job. And this one says, um, give me eight gigs of memory. Now, one of the things with Slurm, which is the scheduler, is that it puts a harsh limit on both of these. If at any given point, your job uh, spans another process that requires more memory than eight gigs, your job will stop. So keep in mind that you might need to play around with this number for your real projects in order to find that sweet spot where you can be optimal about memory, okay? So far, so good, we have the script. So now, that I'm, I'm here on terminal, I should be able to submit that script. So all I'm going to do is type sbatch, which is the command to submit the script. And then I'm gonna submit tutorial one. And you'll see that the scheduler assigned a number and that's the job number, 233235. If I type SQ again, but I do my username, I should be able to see the tutorial. So it's telling me that it's been running for 11 seconds. If I run it again, it's been running for 18. You can also wrap this in the command watch and it will update you every two seconds. So you're gonna see that my job is there. So something is happening. It is not failing so far. If it works, then um, it should create a slash local folder for that job. It's gonna put that tarball there. And at the end, I'm gonna get my images back here. Oh, I should erase this. I think these are the images. Okay, so we can let that run. We're not, we're not really, we don't care about that job to be honest with you. It's it is gonna run, I hope so. Um, and like I said, this is slash local. But the question is, do we have a faster space where we can submit jobs? The answer is yes. We have a scratch space. Okay, you can write to scratch. That's a shared space though. It's not unique to you and there's a limit. So I think it's about 57 terabytes at the moment. Um, 
Alan, do you have any specifics of the of the of the hardware? These are SSDs, right? Yes, these are they're NVMe, um, and it's NFS mounted, is my understanding. But it's uh, very performant. I I routinely get um, over twenty five gigabits on a single transfer. Yeah. So so I/O operations tend to be in general. Uh, better than doing this in your home directory or slash local. But sure, by the way, it's the same file system, okay? Um, so if you have a file specifically that is uh, highly compressed, it is always better to decompress in Scratch than it is to decompress in your home directory. Even if you're losing some, um, even if you're wasting some resources copying the data back and forth at the end of your decompress, it's still gonna be faster than decompressing in your home directory. Okay, so if we go back to the document, you're gonna notice that below I have exactly, I can use exactly the same thing, but instead of using, um, instead of using local, I could use scratch. So I'm gonna go back here and I'm gonna go right click on tutorial and I'm gonna duplicate this file. And then I'm gonna create press F2 to rename it. I'm just gonna call it tutorial two. I'm gonna double click to open the file and I'm gonna, let me close tutorial one, not to get confused. And this is exactly the same job, okay? The only difference is that now, instead of using local, I'm gonna write to scratch. But in order to be safer, I'm gonna create my own space. I'm gonna call it iCalver just to make sure that I know those files are mine. Um, and I'm going to modify this by putting hyphen P just in case if the iCalver doesn't exist, it will create the full, the full, the full path. Um, and basically it's going to do the same operation. It's going to, instead of not writing to local, it's going to write to scratch. Now, remember the job does exactly the same task. The only difference is that it, it has better performance, uh, writing to scratch than it does to, uh, local. Now, remember what I said before, when you write to local, your files go away as soon as your job is finished. That is not the case with Scratch. With Scratch, your files will remain in place up to seven days. So you could go back and recover. By the way, the other thing about slash local is that it's dependent on the compute node where you uh, were running your job. That is why it's your responsibility to move the files back into your home directory. In the case of Scratch, it is visible through every compute node and the workshop VM. So you can finish your job and running, run something on Scratch. And then at the end of your job, you can go back and, and check the files. However, like I said, this is a shared resource. So if you use it, please be careful how much space uh, you're being used, you use. Okay, so for example, this is exactly the same thing. I have the same script. I can go do back and do S batch uh, tutorial two. Um, and this will do exactly the same job, but now it's saving on scratch. For all intents and purposes, this is exactly the same job, will produce the same results. You're just gonna have better performance writing on scratch than you do writing on local. Do you need to have a slurm job active to get access to scratch? No. Uh, because you can access it, access it through the workshop VM. So for example, if I open this old terminal that I had on X2Go, notice here that it says, well, I'm actually gonna go out. You notice that it says L002 here. That meant that I was in a compute node, but now I'm, go ba I'm back at the workshop VM. So there's no allocation associated with this, but let me see if I'm right or wrong. You should be able to see Scratch. Oh, yep. And in fact, you can see it's iCalvert. Oh, and there's the job that is writing the files. So this is actually the files that are being written to disk from the job that I'm currently running on Slurm. There, there you go. See, it's still running a minute. And notice that that images too is the folder associated with this job. If I go back to my desktop, to the zip file folder that I created at the beginning, I should see images one and that images, oh, oh, I overwrote myself, sorry. So these are the files from the first job. It should be 
it should be one, not two. Sorry about that. So I made a little. Actually, let me just. to be consistent. And then eventually it will copy over the, see now it's copying over the, the files, the missing files, so it's okay. Okay, good. So now, so far, this is what we've done. We started the terminal to X2Go, which is the one you're seeing on screen. And we use this to start applications with UI. That includes Fiji, MATLAB, Bot3D, um, and many other tools, okay? Uh, this is certainly faster than starting a remote desktop connection, which is what you did with uh, with Mariah and Look yesterday, okay? Especially if you're like on the road or you have a bad connection. You can use actually open on demand to open a terminal as well and connect to the resources. And you can actually edit files. Like this is a very basic editor, but you know, there's another way to do things. Now, again, this is a very simple job that um, the main purpose of this is to show you how to write to local and to scratch. Now, let's do a second job, okay? So if you notice, we downloaded a bunch of images. Um, let's see. If I do this, I have 2,000 and something files here, 2,000 and, and you know, 3,000 images basically. And the question is, how can we run some operations on these images? So Katie was asking yesterday if we can compute some checksums. Okay, so let's try to do that. So if I do find files, I'm gonna get all of these, okay? So technically, keep, uh, technically speaking, we could compute MD5 sums, right? So I could do MD5 sum, and the path to a file. Uh, sorry. How do I, hey, let me copy. Okay, there you go. And it takes a second, but it computes a checksum for a file. The problem is that I need to find an efficient way to do it. Using Slurm should be definitely the way to go. Okay. So that is exactly what I'm going to do. So I have my folder here. And this is the folder at which I want to compute images. So I'm just going to copy this folder. Okay. And then I'm going to go back here and create a new file. And this header is necessary for all jobs. And this is the directory that I care. Remember, we talked about this. And now I want to find every single file on this folder. Now, you generally would do something like find, you would do something like find directory type F, and this will find all the files in the directory. However, we want to avoid this. Avoid, what we really wanna do is use some other command, LFS find, which is faster in our file system. So know that between the two of these, the second one, the one I'm typing right now, it is much, much faster. This is especially the case if you have a lot of files in your collection, okay? So you have millions and millions of files in your folder. The second command will have a performance that could be thousands of times faster than the first one. And we, we experienced some cases with folders that had, you know, 25 million files. Okay. So remember we use the command MD5 and sum and the file name, right? Remember that? So we can mix these two things to compute the file names at the same time. So we could do something like X arguments. And you know what? If I do this, this should compute the checksum that I want. So I'm gonna call this MD5 uh, sum one. I'm gonna save it. And then I'm gonna go back to here. And if you remember, I saved this on SIP and I'm gonna time it. So I can do time MD, 
Oh wait, bash MD5 sum one. Now this is gonna run and it's working. It's computing the checksums efficiently, but I'm guessing that it's gonna take two to three minutes to do this, okay? Especially because some of these OME tips are kind of large. By the way, this is a dummy tarball. These are not your typical images uh, that you process here on Bill. This is some dummy, dummy tarball from another project. Uh, depending on the size of your images, whether they're uh, IMS, OME TIFF, uh, smaller files, this will change. But basically what we're doing right now is computing checksums. Let it finish. Now let us go back. The question is, can we do this more efficiently? Yes, of course. Because we talk about it that we can submit this to the scheduler. Uh, I can do S batch and I can submit it to the Q compute and S batch. And let's say that I give it four cores and I do this um, and I assign it eight gigs. Well, the reality is that this job is a waste of time. It's a waste of resources because what we've seen here in this command is that we're computing checksums in sequentially, right? So this is finding the list of files and this is running them one by one. So if I assign four cores, three of these cores are gonna get wasted because we're only gonna be using one at a time. So there's one thing that we can do. I just want this to finish so that I can, that I can show you. So come on, you can do this. Um, it does take a couple of minutes. Okay, well, I'll go back to my script. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a new file, text file, and I'm gonna copy the same thing, but you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna assign 20 cores now this time. Um, and this one I'm gonna call MD5 sum two dot shell. But like I told you before, um, I'm wasting 19 cores. But with the X argument command, since these are running serially, I can say, you know what? Run them in parallel and run 20 at a time. So now what we're gonna do, and actually I'm gonna give you more memory just in case. Remember that we have considerable resources for doing some of these things. I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna open a second terminal. So I'm gonna let that one finish. And I'm gonna go back to the desk and to set, but remember I had this, um, this is a script that I created and I asked it to allocate 20 cores and to run 20 at a time. So I'm just gonna submit MD5 sum two. And now you gotta sign a job at the queue. I can watch the queue. And you're gonna notice that there's my job. Well, notice that this one has been running for, oh, it took three minutes to run. And we've been looking at this job for 14 seconds. It's done in 14 seconds. While this one got done in three minutes, okay? So you can find, this is a very dummy example using X arguments, but there are a lot of applications that you can build in Python, in MATLAB, and in some other languages when you can exploit the fact that some of these large memory, not all of the large memory nodes have 80 cores. Um, so you can do multi-threading, uh, you can do uh, a multi-core processing. Um, so you can exploit that to your advantage, right? Um, for example, we do parallel computation using Java. We have to tweak some of the settings from the, uh, the JVM, but, but a lot of these things are doable. If you have questions about parallelizing your code, we can help you to a certain degree. So again, remember, you can always send email to build support and we'll do our best uh, to help you with all of this. Okay, so notice how, <coughs> sorry, in this, very simple example, we went from three minutes to 30 to 15 seconds. Does anyone have a question? I have, have, you seen that yeah, I have a question actually. I was wondering, um, so it was kind of from earlier. I'm just wondering like how much space is available on Scratch 
I know you said it's like a shared resource, but like how much? 57 terabytes. 57 at terabytes. The, okay. At the moment. At the moment. For, like, is that for everybody or is that just for? Yeah, for everybody. That's for a shared everybody. resource. Okay. Yes. So like, don't. <laughs> okay. Got you. So it, it, like, it would be, it would be rude to use more than like a terabyte or so, I would assume. I mean, it's, I mean, it's not widely used, but just make sure that whatever you're using, um, you erase it at the end. Yeah. Or move it. I'll tell okay. you that we had a case of a data provider that submitted um, a series of compressed files that were using a very special compression that require hours to decompress. And these were not really large files. They were like really small files. So our performance went from, I think from two megabytes per second on Luster to about two gigs on Scratch. So yes, it will. you will definitely do better decompressing files on Scratch than you do on your home directory. Even if you lose a lot of time moving them back to your, to your, to your home directory or, or, or landing zone. Okay. And what I wanted to mention is that uh, we do, at, whenever a data set becomes public, um, we do compute some inventories and eventually these inventories will become public. So you will be able to download all the checksum information for all the files in build data. Uh, so you should be able to, to gather this information um, very quickly just to verify that the checksums are correct or that the, the files that you received, um, that we receive uh, are, are proper. Um, like I think Luke mentioned yesterday, a part of our validation process is we check for things like empty files and and weird file names but we do provide the inventory just in case that you know you need a quick verification of the contents of, of build what's in build data you can have a snapshot of what what's in the public space okay so let's recap open on demand for jupiter and our studio it uses the large memory nodes um you can use it to connect to build through the terminal or you can just use it to edit files or, or, or basically do anything you want that's related to Jupyter and to Python and R. You can use text to go to start a remote desktop connection, or you can use it to start a terminal that has an X, X window connection. So you can open applications with a UI. Um, and then you can use regular terminal applications to connect to, to the build resources. There's a table in the document at the beginning but Luke yesterday also provided a list of tools that you could use. Luke also provided yesterday with tools that you can use to upload data into, um, into the system, including our sync, terminal, WinSCP. Uh, there's many tools for different OSs. Um, someone asked a question about Globus yesterday when Luke was talking about Mac and Windows, he was just talking about the Globus desktop connection, uh, which is a, a a desktop tool provided by Globus, but you should be able to, in Linux to either install the CLI client or um, there are some Python bindings that, that work, but to be honest with you, I never used the Python bindings for Globus. I know they work, I just don't know how they work. So I never uploaded data with that, uh, but, but, it, but it is doable on, on the three main OSs. By the way, the, I, this is just a side note. The main reason why I like Open On Demand is because when sometimes I'm on the go, uh, because it works in a browser, you can potentially use it on a netbook or like an iPad. So you can you can have this computational power uh, even when you're on the go. You can easily connect through terminal to build just to double check the status of your projects very quickly or your jobs without having to carry your laptop. Um, so that's the main reason why I really enjoy using On Demand. Does anybody have questions, concerns? I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, of course. Um, have you ever used Dask 
distributed uh, slurm? Yes, yes. But Yana is the person that has more experience in this team with Dask than I do. So she can, probably can give you a better answer than I can. Okay, great. How does it so, work, Yana? Well, actually, I mostly use Dask Delete, not Dask Distributed at Build. Maybe Alan has more understanding of how it works. Yeah, Matt, I, I've used Dask Distributed, um, although I, I have yet to uh, do this across a, a large cluster, right? I'm usually using it as a local distributed cluster. It, it works really quite well. Um, I, I think if if you have interest in you know spinning up a, a large distributed cluster, we can we can talk about ways to do that. It's it's in theory relatively straightforward. I just have not personally done it. By by local, do you mean these local eight nodes? No. So uh, in Dask distributed, you can start up a a local cluster okay. where you need a distributed client, but it's on a single machine. Okay, yeah, um, I see. I see. It, it's my preferred way actually to use Dask and and we generally see better performance out of it on a on a single machine. I see. Great. Yeah, that's, that's the same way I've used it too on on one of the large memory nodes because these are fairly large. They have 80 cores and 4 terabytes of RAM. You can set uh -huh. up a local cluster very efficiently. It's just that you need to make sure that you request a whole node during your allocation. And also remember that you only can access the compute node for 48 hours. So you, you need to find that spot where, you know, running your job for 48 hours or less is efficient for, for your progress. Got it. Does anybody have any other questions? Yeah, I, I have a question about um, Scratch again. So is this, is it, is it like mounted in memory or something or how, what, what is the actual hardware behind it? Why is it so much faster? Um, Alex, can you answer that question? I don't. It's, it's SSD. Oh, it's just an SSD. Okay. It's, so like, it's several SSDs, but yeah, it's an SSD file system. So I'm just like, theoretically, if like one of the large memory no nodes has four terabytes of RAM, I could mount something to memory and it would be faster. Yeah, um, yeah, the, and there's there's the local on there on the, the nodes too, which is NVMe. Um, Oh, okay. I'm confused because I thought Scratch was faster. If it's local as NVMe, shouldn't it be faster than an SSD? I think they're both NVMe, um, but one, you know, with slash local, you're going over the network. Or sorry, with slash Scratch, you're going over the network. With slash local, it's it's direct to the NVMe, so you're better off using it. Okay, I'm. So, I mean, there, there is there is some difference too, and and that's um, how data is is being replicated between that. Um, so I think. So wait, slash local now local drives on the compute nodes. That changed. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry, I I I gave them false information. I I didn't know we updated those. So. So performance now now. Now performance should be equivalent between local and scratch then? Is, is that correct? If they're both NVMe? Local well, should, I would okay, I would I would do a test case to be sure, but local yeah. should be faster. Um, but the the data on local, so it's not it's not that you're writing to the raw NVME, it's you're writing to a file system that's made up of, of NVME. So there is some okay. duplication that's that's going on to prevent data loss as you're writing, mm -hmm. um, but it's it's fairly minimal. Um, whereas the the uh, the scratch is is a larger file system. It's made up of of many um, many. Uh, well, I'll just call them drives, but um, many SSDs, NVMEs, whatever. Um, yeah. And uh, the the way that it does the the replication to prevent data loss is is a different RAID model. 
so all that impacts performance at some level, but I believe that the local should be faster than than scratch, but your performance may vary depending on what you're doing. Um, so, so what we can do is we do have some bench, benchmarks that I can run, and then I can put this the, the results of the benchmark on, on the document that I share with you. Yeah, it's too bad Greg's not on here because I know he's done. He would have that answer in his head. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks. That's that's interesting. So yeah, maybe in the future we might be taking um, advantage of some possibility of like extracting stuff on um, on demand instead of having to send a bunch of little files. Another question, other question for y'all? Yes, yes, more questions. I have a couple of questions. And these are, uh, well, a comment. Thank you so much for these presentations and this information. Super excited, especially what Alan talked about, the on-demand OME and GFF. And I love the, the web on-demand interface. I was wondering with that and the Jupyter instance, is there a way to customize the, the Jupyter Lab extensions that you get? and the, the Python kernels that you have available? Do you know yet? At, at the moment, at the moment, no, but that's the next step of, of selecting your own kernel. We do mm -hmm. that for some of the other systems like Bridges too. We just need to test it and implement it on, on, on Bill. Regarding the extensions, that's a little bit trickier right. in the sense that uh, some of them are, 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 some of them are more stable than others. Let's just put it that way. Mm -hmm. So we would rather just have a subset of curated extensions that you can enable rather than to let the user do it on their own. Okay. Um, but but yes, we, we would consider, especially some of the debugging extensions are really useful. So maybe at some point enable them in the near future for the next workshop, yeah. The Dask, the one for Dask, it's really good. The, the, the extension that follows the Dask cluster. It's, right. it's, it's a really good extension as well. Mm -hmm. And another question there that that's helpful. Thank you. And, you know, if we do like Yana showed with her tutorial on doing the analysis and create some drive data, maybe this was discussed yesterday. I, I didn't make it, but is there a way to share with people your results of secondary analysis? at all or what would be the best way to go about that so I'm, I'm going to answer that two different ways um the the first way is is that data can be made public through bill um, but we need the complete metadata system the metadata specification if you're running some data and you just you would get a result and you want to share it with someone um, as long as they have access to the bill system there's ways that that can be done through access control lists or um, what we do with a lot of the projects is we set up um, some specific project groups so that um, a series of users all belong to the same project group and um, they can have access that way. We do have some longer term plans um, that probably won't be implemented this year, um, but particularly in, in situations that um, let's say that somebody submits a paper and they want their data, their data not to be public, but they want it to be public for reviewers, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, we, do, we do have plans to set up a system so that, that, that people can, can do that. Um, and once that's set up, I think the use case of just, you know, what's the difference between a, a reviewer and some anonymous user somewhere um, from from a software perspective, isn't you know it, it's not a not a long haul to get there from once you have the reviewer link set up. Got it. Thanks.
Any other questions? So what would you like to do, Alex, Mariah? Do we do, do you want to stay until 4 p.m. just in case more questions arise? What would you like to do? Yeah, we can stay on as 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 long as we need to. Um, if there's there's no further questions, um, folks can feel free to to drop off. If there are additional questions, um, you can uh, certainly ask us at this time. But uh, outside of that, uh, thank you for attending. We hope this was useful. We'll probably send out a survey either the end of this week or beginning of next week um, to get your feedback on this workshop. And we'd appreciate that uh, you fill it out and give us your feedback. Thank you.